All right, so uh, I'm Jonathan Belcher, JB. Um, I am a JavaScript Electro Wizard at Automatic. So we do WordPress.com, Jetpack, and I work on WooCommerce. Uh, so um, I'm at the Drupal audience, it's fun. Um, but the, like a lot of this, the, all this content is like everybody on the web should be doing, no matter like what tools we're using. If you're using Reb, uh, React, Drupal, Ember, Angular, WooCommerce, WordPress, any of that. Everybody should be doing all of these things. Uh, I'm also a Google developer expert uh, on, uh, for web technologies. Um, and I organize Liberty.js, which is a JavaScript conference here in Philadelphia. Um, it's going to be in the fall, so watch for that. It's going to be awesome. I think it's our fifth year. Um, so reliable, fast, engaging. Um, the, traditionally, uh, it's there's been like a big, um, big debate. You know, is do we need a native app? And a lot of times, the answer's been absolutely 100% yes. There are a lot of features of, uh, that that native apps have that the web just cannot compete with. So native apps are better, right? The web doesn't have all of the features we need for an engaging experience, right? Well, that has been the story in the past, but today. The story is, is really, really starting to change. Safari has implemented a lot of the new web features, and now a majority of your mobile users can have this really, really engaging experience right in the browser. And sometimes they don't even know they're in the browser, and sometimes they don't even know it's not a native app. Native app usage is really concentrated on like that top five apps. You know, it's your Facebooks, your Twitters, you know, those, those apps, uh, Google Maps, you know, Gmail. Um, as a you know, as a brand or as a company, how are you going to get your user to download, go to the app store, download an app, install it on their on their phone, and then actually use it? It's a really really difficult flow to, to make to make that leap. You're going to have to really sell me on the benefits. Like I better be getting like 20% you know discount coupons or something. Um, how many apps have you installed in the last month? If you've installed more than 10, more than five, more than two, more than, okay, all right, so we've got two or three. If you haven't installed any apps in the last month, raise your hand. All right, so I mean like almost half the room. So that's a, that, that is the situation that we're in. There's a lot of people, yes, you need a native app. Uh, but for the most part, it, that, may not all, um, that may not entirely be the case anymore. So, what is a PWA? To get that native-like experience for our user, we need to have a fast, integrated, reliable, and engaging experience. So, fire, uh, if you look at all the first letters there. So, fast, you need a really, really blazing uh, fast initial first load. And this is really difficult because with a, a native app, they get to download everything onto your phone and it's already there, right? So their initial experience is like, well, we have to do it much faster and we have to do it with much less. <clears throat> As a secondary, uh, on your secondary loads, you need to be blazing fast. When you open an app, it loads like instantly. It's there, it's ready to go. Websites, we don't usually have that experience. It is not already loaded. We need to reload it every single time. Well, we used to. Integrated, we need to integrate into the, into the browser that you're using, into the I, uh, iOS, the OS that you're using. Uh, you need to use as many of those inter integration points as you can to make it an experience for the user that's expected. That needs to be reliable. Uh, when we're sitting in front, when we're sitting at our desks or at home on our computer, on our you know broadband, you know Comcast gigabit internet, like things are fast. The, you're never going to lose internet. You should never lose internet connection. That's that's great. But then you go to a coffee shop and somebody's watching Netflix and somebody's playing <coughs> video games, uh, and it's just not a great experience. Then you're on your mobile phone and you're riding the train out to Conshohocken, and there's like a dead spot out there. Or at least I've been told about this. Um, and you just have no internet. You have no websites. You can't use. Uh, uh, you know that website that you're that you were reading. You know if it refreshes, you're done. You're getting the dinosaur. Um, and engaging. So we need to 
we have uh, we come as the web we come from a web page sort of mentality where we're creating this you know you got to have a header then you got to have like a showcase where you can have like a slideshow a couple of videos you know or pictures or something and then you're gonna have more text and you're gonna have a bunch of images like that's not where the web is today like we some things that makes sense for but a lot of times you're building a web app you're building an app and native they they come from a they never had that web page mentality so they came from i need to build an app uh and it's native we need to start thinking and building our apps in a way that resemble those native apps and um so i mean that's pretty much uh, pwa like okay well really what is it what do i need to do like what are the things that i need to do to my website to make all of that happen well there's a couple major things that I'm going to go through that uh, in this talk today, uh, but it's just a, wide, a really wide range of technologies that you can implement to make your website like this. Um, and so it makes it really difficult to start. Uh, who's heard of Lighthouse? All right, so a couple people. Uh, let's take a look at drupaldelphia.org. And I loaded pretty quick. So let's take a look at the dev tools. And inside of your dev console, you're going to have, uh, across the top, you're going to have your tabs. And we're going to go out to audits. And audits has been in the, it has been in the Chrome dev tools for about three or four versions now. Uh, and you can perform an audit. So, uh, and you select which audits to perform. It, if you click them off, it doesn't run any faster or anything like that. And basically what it's going to do is it's going to, it's going to, um, emulate a 3G connection on a slower device on a mobile phone as opposed to like this huge honking MacBook Pro that can like do all the processing. So it's going to emulate that that slower, worse experience. So uh, it's going to determine the baseline of where we need to be for our least capable user. So it's going to grab all that together and it's going to create us a uh, report. Um, it, it did just say Walmart saw a 1% increase in revenue for every 100 milliseconds of speed increase. There's like tons of stats out there. If you just go looking for them, you'll find them. Um, speed equals money. Uh, time equals money? Yeah. Um, so across the top, they're going to give you a bunch of different metrics. Uh, we're concerned about the progressive web app today. So... Um, Keep scrolling here. We're going to get down, and we're going to see that there are six failed audits. In most websites, it actually might even be more than that. Uh, it says we do not register a service worker. We'll talk about what a service worker is, but it pretty much gives us the ability to serve offline to our users. <coughs> it does not respond with, when a two hundred. Uh, it does not respond with a two hundred when offline. It completely fails. So that means we just need a service worker. Page does not load fast enough on 3G. I could give a 10 hour talk on performance and like all the things you need to do, but Lighthouse is gonna give you some guidance and like things that you need to do. If we look up here, um, off screen images, lazy load some of your images in, um, reduce the render blocking scripts. I think jQuery's in there. It, it, it could probably be deferred. Uh, so there's a couple things that you can do to like make your website a little bit faster. That's part of the fast. Uh, user will not be prompted to install as a web app. This is a really great example of uh, a web page that should be a web app um, because it's got the schedule, it's got the location, it's got a lot of information that I'm going to need while I'm at a conference with a million other technologists bogging down that, uh, bogging down the network connection, and most likely I'm going to have a bad connectivity experience. Um, is not configured for a custom splash screen. Okay, uh, we'll get to that. Manifest does not have a color theme. We'll also get to that. Here's the big one. Uses, this website does use HTTPS, and we'll talk about why that's important here in a minute. So it gives you like a lot of things to start with, a lot of low-hanging fruit. Um, once you get through this list, there, there are a bunch of other things to do as well. PWA features you already know. Pages are responsive on tablets and mobile. Well, we've been talking about mobile first for 
I don't know, I guess it's probably been 10 years at least. Uh, so everybody probably aware of making things responsive, using media queries, all that fun stuff. First load fast on 3G. Well, <coughs> we all know that our websites need to be fast. It's just a matter of making them fast, uh, which is an entirely different thing. Uh, site works cross-browser. So it's a progressive web app is really about, we need to give an experience to everybody. That's step one. Let's give everybody an experience. Even if they have a five-year-old Android phone on 3G, 2G, like nothing, right? Like we need to give everybody something. Then we can progressively make a better application from there. It's also progressive enhancement. Uh, each page has a URL, and we'll talk about why that's super important later. But if you're building single page applications utilizing like a REST API or something like that, Use the, use the URLs. URLs are really, really great for state management. Make sure you have URLs. And then your site content is indexed by Google. A lot of times we build these really intense JavaScript applications that Google has no idea what to do with. They can process JavaScript, but they can't always see what's going on on your site. So make sure Google has a tool that you can use that can analyze your site and tell you what it is seeing when it goes to your website as the Google bot. Also be aware that the Google bot is not the latest Chrome version. The Google bot runs like five or six uh, versions back uh, and it doesn't update regularly. Yes? It's, uh, it's stuck on 42 forever. And oh, it's stuck on, forever, but, like, but for a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember being super surprised at that. Um, 42 is not that old. That's like, what, maybe two years old? Uh, yeah. I was at a, the conference last week and they were talking about CSS grid layouts. And yeah. so it, it can't read any of it can't. that. You can't. No, no. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, let's say you, you're home, you get home, you're super excited about PWAs. Like you need some quick wins to be like, hey, come in Monday morning and be like, hey, boss, hey, manager, like I learned so much at this talk. Here's two things that you can do like in an hour and like, you'll be awesome. Uh, Autocomplete, autofill. So Chrome, Firefox, uh, everybody has like these autofill capabilities. You type in your name and your address and all of those things. I turn it off personally, but a lot of people use them. Um, it doesn't know, it tries to figure out what fields equal what. And I know a lot of websites, uh, I go and it, uh, you know, I'm testing the autofill and it just doesn't work. There is an autocomplete attribute that you put on inputs and you give it, this is a credit card name. This is a first name. This is a last name. This is a credit card expiry. There's a whole list of them up on MDN, uh, Microsoft, uh, Mozilla developer network. Uh, and just go do all of your, do all of your input fields. Uh, it, uh, it's a quick win. Uh, also theme color. In, your, in the head of your uh, HTML, in your uh, head, uh, just put uh, a meta tag and give it a name of theme color and give it just the color hex code. I did this for WooCommerce.com and I got a ping on Slack a couple days later with like somebody who was super duper excited about it. I was like, oh my gosh, how did you do that? And uh, so. What was the purpose? Uh, oh, <laughs> my bad, <laughs> my bad. Uh, it changes the color of the of the header of the of the screen where the URL bar is and everything like that. So WooCommerce is purple, so it changes the header bar to purple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, but it only does it on Android mobile. But it's a quick way, and it's a five minute change, and you can do it, and it'll delight the the some however many users are on Android Chrome. Yeah. It's a quick change. Uh, it is a standard, so it should be implemented in other browsers sometime in the future. Um, yeah. Uh, so those are my those are my quick wins. Go home and do those. You know, Monday morning tonight. I don't know where. Uh, HTTPS to power a lot of this technology, you have to have HTTPS enabled. Um, why do you want HTTPS? It's security. It's end-to-end -end encryption. So if I send something to a server, I know that that server is going to receive exactly what I sent it, and vice versa. Whatever the server sends me, I know that that's what the server sent me. If you don't have that, somebody can 
snoop in the middle and get your credit card number. Somebody could be in the middle there and inject ads onto a website that didn't have any ads before. Um, so this is a this is a situation where HTTPS for every website for every situation. There is a performance hit for that, but we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, it is needed for a lot of these features that uh, we're going to talk about. The service worker have to have HTTPS enabled. Uh, geolocation you have to have HTTPS enabled. Additionally, uh, now Google, if you don't have it enabled, is not going to have that little green lock in the in the top in the URL bar. And as a user, if I don't see that and I'm entering any sort of information onto a site, I'm, I'm very skeptical of what's going on there. Uh, in the future, it's actually going to be red instead of, I think it's yellow now. Uh, if there's any input fields on a page, it's yellow. In the future, it's going to be red. So I'll like, get that done before that happens. You don't want your user seeing that. How? So let's encrypt free. You don't have to pay for your certificates anymore. It's awesome. Uh, like super simple. They have uh, tutorials on how to do it. They most mo uh, you know most hosts are going to have you know let's encrypt or some other alternative like there for you. So it shouldn't be too difficult. Uh, get it done. Uh, traffic redirect all traffic to HTTPS. People, some people still type in all of the HTTP colon four slash four. So people still type that in. Make sure that you're redirecting. And all the old links that uh, that are all over the internet, linking to your page, you need to uh, you need to uh, forward all that content to HTTPS. Um, all sort of stuff, not, not too difficult to do. If you're really worried about the the speed uh, implications of of um, HTTPS. HSTS is an, an alternative, and there have been speed increases there that make it like almost as fast as HTTP. Cost maybe a day or two of work, you know, depending on how complex your situation is. So, service workers, they're really the biggest part of progressive web apps. I mean, everything else sort of just like revolves around service workers. Service worker is just a JavaScript file, that's all it is. It's a JavaScript file. And that JavaScript file is um, you enable it as a uh, service worker, and that service worker is a network proxy. <coughs> Anything that your uh, browser requests, like let's say I click a, I click a, um, um, I'm loading up and I'm loading an image, right? It goes to the service worker, and the service worker runs and does its magic and can intercept that network call, or it can just send it off to send it off to the server. So it's a network proxy. It lives between your browser and the network. It is, all it is is a web worker. So it's running in a separate thread. So you have your main thread that is doing all your DOM manipulation and you know, parsing all of the CSS and JavaScript. This lives in a completely separate thread. So you, know, it's, it's, uh, you can run things in parallel. The, the stuff that it's going to do over here is not going to uh, affect the performance of your site other than being slow to return assets. But, um, so that's, that's cool. Like you can run like really heavy data manipulation things in a web worker and it doesn't affect the performance on your site. But it can't, the web worker can't interact with DOM because it, it just does, it doesn't know that it's there. So it's completely separate. So think of it and like you know, it's a nice little black box. The way it works is you say, hey, this is my service worker, and install it. And I'll show you how to do that in a second. It's either going to error out, it's going to return an error, it's going to set, just fail completely because something is malformed or there's a JavaScript error, or it's going to become activated. Right? Once it's activated, it's just sitting there waiting. It's just going to wait. Right? And it's going to wait for a fetch. So if your browser, your page, wants some resource that's making a REST call, or it needs an image, or it needs something, it's going to respond. It's going to run when that, that thing is requested. right? Or it's going to get a message from the server. Your server can send messages to the service worker. right? So push notifications, the, the biggest use of that. 
it's a little scary writing a service worker, uh, to be completely honest. It is, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Um, the, the biggest one that you always hear about is that you set up caching and you say, hey, this image, get it from the cache, right? And the service worker gets it from the cache. But what happens if that image changes? I change the image. Now, the service worker says to get it from the cache, and the, and the server has a completely different image, and your boss is yelling at you, saying, hey, I told you to change that image, and it's sitting on the server, it's ready to go, and it's there for all the new users, but anybody who loaded that service worker, who loaded that image in the cache, it's still sitting there, and it's gonna sit there until you change the service worker, uh, or if you set up the service worker correctly, you told it to um, you told it to pull from the cache, but then update the image in the background, right? So there's a there's a couple ways that you can there's a couple different caching strategies here. It's network first, right? It's going to go to the network, and it's going to get that that image, and then it'll go to the then it'll go to the cache. There's also cache first goes to the cache. If it's in the cache, pull that. If not, it'll go out to the network. There's also cache only, there's fastest, there's a bunch of different strategies, and it really depends on like what your situation is for what style of caching you're doing. And even, even more fine-grained than that, like individual things. You may have a JavaScript file that's never, ever going to change, like ever. Like that, you, just, you can say cache only, and you're good to go, and if you ever did need to change it, you could push a new service worker to tell it to update. If you do completely mess up your service worker, service workers are told to update 24 hours, every 24 hours. So it checks the file on the server, and if there's a new file, it downloads it, and it, then it becomes a server, a, a worker in waiting. I love this term, it's a worker in waiting. It's just sitting there waiting, right? Because all of the, um, all of the windows, all, all of the instances of that page need to be closed before it's gonna pull in that new service worker. If you really botch things, you can over, you can force, you can tell it, hey, don't ever use that other service worker again, you have to use this. So there are ways around it if you mess up. But thankfully, Google realized that this was a really difficult thing to do, and so they have something called uh, uh, Workbox, and also uh, SW Toolbox, and I'd sort of like to walk through like some of the commands in the SW Toolbox to show you like how that works. And basically what you do is you include the server worker toolbox JavaScript file, and then it gives you a, a variable, it's an object, that has a bunch of different methods hanging on it and allows you to interact. And basically it builds your service worker for you. You don't have to do all the mess. Uh, and that, that uses a, it requires compile. Uh, but then it also loads in, in um, at time of execution. So I'll show you, show you that. Um, so once you load up the, the JavaScript for toolbox, right? It's just toolbox right there. Uh, and you say dot router dot get. And you're going to say your URL. So that means it's going to go get that URL. And you're saying toolbox dot network first. That's your caching strategy. So it's going to go to the network first before it caches that thing. It's pretty straightforward. Who's used Express before, anybody? So Express is like a Node.js web framework, you know, uh, pretty, pretty simple. But this uses a similar syntax. So I say toolbox.router.get, it uses a colon here. And that's to tell me, hey, this is a parameter. So if I have like um, category, then slash, if I put a colon ID, it knows that that's a parameter, and it takes that foo, and it puts it into values, and then passes it into the function that runs, right? So, I tell it I want a category. Category is of ID 10, right? It passes that value 10 into the function. It runs a function. That function could then go to the server, right, and get a resource doesn't necessarily have to get that category resource. You could like say, give me all the categories. Then inside of this function, I could sort through that, that object and pull out just that one category 
and give it that category. So just because you, just because service worker is mainly a caching, like that's what a lot of people are using for today, you can do anything you want. You can completely rework the data and pass it back. You could just grab a part of that thing and pass it back. But you have to be careful. Um, Firefox in private browsing mode will not load a service worker. Um, in addition to that, service workers are only in Firefox and in Chrome. Uh, I think Edge got service workers. I should have checked all that. Uh, but uh, if not, it's coming soon. Um, Safari, the, the, new, the new release that's about to come out, guess what? It's got service workers. So Chrome, we're talking uh, Android, we're talking iOS in a couple weeks, whenever that comes out. Uh, you're talking like a majority of desktop web can use the service workers. But you can't get too fancy in there because if you do something like data manipulation and you pass it back, you got to realize that not all your browsers are going to be able to use that thing. So you need to make sure that you have backups. Okay, so uh, you can also have routes that use, um, that use regex. So you can do regular expressions in here. Um, so that's pretty awesome. Uh, default route, uh, pre-caching. This is another thing. You know that every page on your website is going to need this thing. They may not need it right now, but they're going to need it in the future, right? You know that every page has a list of sponsor images, right? The Drupaladelphia website. We're going to we're going to load those on every page. So you can tell the service worker, hey, go get these assets and put them into the cache. And then they can respond immediately. They're already there. They don't have to load. Perfect. Okay. So the cost on, oh, there's a lot of MDN resources on this. There's tons of Google resources on this. If you're interested in service workers, there's going to be like five talks at Google I.O. in two weeks. Um, so watch this. Uh, the cost, it's variable. Right? It's really, really simple to set up. But like you can go deep and you can go and you can do all sorts of things that could take, you know, uh, uh, it's very variable. So it's very, you should start small and you should just start with caching and the pre-cache and then, and then just add things as you, as you need them. <coughs> so service workers are pretty easy to get started with. Uh, like I said, you have a JavaScript file. So you just have sw.js sitting there. It's either compiled via like Workbox or Toolbox uh, or some other you know <coughs> generator or you wrote it yourself. You see there's the navigator object in all browsers and you're seeing if service worker exists. If service worker exists you're going to say navigator dot service worker dot register. So that's the the register function. It takes the, uh, the, the, the path to the JavaScript file and uh, Service workers use lots of promises. So if you're not familiar with JavaScript promises, study up on the JavaScript promises because you're going to use them a lot. It's going to say, once that service worker is registered, then run this function right here. Oh, it's not click. We're going to run this function. And all this function, is, all this function does, you can do other things if you need to, uh, but it's going to say your service worker registration succeeded. It also has a catch, right? If it doesn't work, then it, you can run another function. Also, you know, you can do an else if uh, your if service worker doesn't exist on Navigator to let your you wouldn't be console and logging. You may like tell your JavaScript, hey, I can't use a service worker. You're gonna have to do things a different way. Okay. So push messages. Who loves push messages? Like, you just, like, on your phone, you're getting notifications of, like, hey, uh, you're within 20 meters of a Walgreens. You should come in and buy stuff from us. <laughs> it's like, okay, all right, come on. Uh, there are some notifications that are, like, absolutely great, right? My bank says, hey, it's the second. You didn't pay the mortgage, buddy. Uh, or my credit card says, hey, you are, you know, within... A thousand dollars of your limit, or hey, there was this really big purchase yesterday. Call us to like make sure that these are important things. These are notifications that I absolutely want. These are engaging experiences. Push notifications aren't always that way. 
You go to any newspaper website today and they're asking you, hey, do you want to get notifications from us? And the answer is always no. Um, yes, the answer is always no. Uh, so think about your strategy. You need to interact with your user at a time when they're going to want those notifications. It's the, it's the same debate that we ha we've been having for years you know, uh, in the native space. It's just like, hey, when do you ask for notifications? When the user does something that tells you that they want notifications, right? Otherwise, the acceptance rate is going to be slow, uh, really low, and you're not going to get the benefit that you want. So, uh, the problem with uh, so you you have to have uh, you have to have a service worker to send uh, notifications, right? So you have to have something on their browser that is long running, that's going to be sitting there waiting for that message to come in. It's just sitting there waiting, right? Uh, if you don't have the service worker and they close the tab, there's no way for them to get that push notification because there's nothing running, there's nothing sitting there waiting for that push notification to come in. Yeah. So this isn't super easy. <coughs> like you have to. Uh, the, the, the dialogue that says, hey, I want to send you notifications, it's super easy. It's just a function you call and you give it some like, you give it some information and then it returns you a token, right? You then have to take that token, right? And you have to send that out to a backend server and that backend server has to hang on to that token and associate it with you as the person, as like an account, unless it's, a, unless it's an anonymous token, right? Uh, it has to then keep that on the server, and then when something changes on your account, you need to send, uh, the back end needs to send your notification server saying, hey, send this user this message, and it has to you know, look up that token, and then it has to send that out, right? That's a lot of plumbing. Uh, there are services that do this, but be aware that that plumbing can get complicated, and it can get messy. The front end stuff, like receiving the message, it's really, really easy. Inside of the service worker, you're just going to get a JSON object, right? And and then it's going to well, once once it gets the once it knows that it's a notification, it's going to get a JSON object. And as long as you style or you format that object correctly, it's going to display the notification, right? It's just going to give them the notification. So you give it a body, it's just the text. Hey. Um, did you make a million dollar purchase at Dr. Evil? Uh, you need to give it an icon because uh, that's the little icon that displays next to it. Uh, it doesn't, that icon doesn't necessarily show on all, um, on all browsers and all notifications, you know, all platforms. Uh, you can tell it how to vibrate. I really like that. Uh, I don't know if it does it on iOS. I don't have an iOS phone, but on Android, like when I, when I get a certain vibration, I know that it's from a specific app or a specific website, and I think that's pretty amazing. Um, so you can like specify the, the frequency there, um, and then you just give it actions, and the actions could be you know yes, no, uh, activate my account, uh, log in, or anything you want it to be, and you can provide a URL. Now remember, I talked about every page has to have a URL. Have you ever had that experience where you click on a notification and it opens up the app and then you're just sitting there looking at the home of that app and you're like, okay, like there's a security alert on my account, but I don't see any security alerts. I don't see anything. I just see my account. That's a really dangerous place to be in. You don't want to do that to your user. Okay. So uh, the other like main PWA thing, the thing that you have to have is a manifest. Right? Manifest is just describing your application. It tells the browser, hey, these are the, these are the things that my application does, and these are the images to display, and all of the information that the browser needs. It allows you to do, add to home screen. It defines uh, icons. Uh, it defines what permissions your app, can, your app is going to ask for. Uh, it keeps all of your metadata nice and contained into like one JSON file, and you just provide it via a meta tag, and you're good to go. Um, there, are, uh, each browser is a little different. What they require for that, like add to home screen, um, uh, 
dialogue to pop up. You, as the developer, don't tell the browser, say, I want my user to add this to home screen. You, you don't tell them that anymore. The browser will automatically do it. Uh, and the browser, and, well, and Chrome will wait to, add, to ask the user if they want it to add to home screen until the user has interacted sufficiently with the app to tell Chrome that they, should, that they might want to add to home screen, which I think is amazing because then it's not automatically just popping up on you. You need to provide, for, uh, for Chrome, you need to provide short name, name, start URL, and icons, right? Short name, okay, name, uh, start URL. That's where, that's the entrance, the entrance points to your application. Pretty straightforward. Icons, um, you're going to provide an icon so that it knows what icon to put on the home screen. Uh, you're going to also want to provide a splash image. <coughs> so when you load up an app, you might see like, um, you might see like an image that loads up while like things are happening in the background. Uh, per, if you provide it that, it'll, get even, it'll look even more like a native application. You can do this in an hour. Even if you don't want to do any of the other features, just by adding this, you can get that add to home screen functionality. Um, uh, MDN has great resources on this. There's a lot of other information that you can provide to the browser. Um, and start with basics. Google Dev Docs has a really, really great tutorial on how to do that. Okay, so uh, now we're down to the payment request API. And we talked a lot about integration, that like integrating inside of a browser um, it means a lot to the user. It gives them a little, uh, little security net. It makes them feel good and happy. Uh, Payment Request API is available, has been available for a while in Chrome. It is coming in the next version of Safari. So that's exciting. You're going to have it on all the platforms. Uh, it's basically a way to uh, integrate payments. It's a function that you can call, and it has a standard inputs, and it hands you back all of the information. It's like this really tight bundle that you need to send off to your payment processor, right? The great part about this is, is that Chrome, uh, well, I, presumably Safari will too, it has a lot of your information, right? You can save credit cards into Chrome. You can save addresses into Chrome. If the person has saved all of this information, the checkout flow is they click one button, it pops up the payment request thing and you just tell it, hey, here's my total. Here are maybe any, like, here's my shipping amount. Uh, maybe here is, like, uh, some other things. Um, and here are the payment methods that I can take. I can take Visa, MasterCard, but I don't take American Express. And then, th then they can pay. It's right there. It happens all in the browser stuff. All of that information is there, um, and it's, it's more secure. They click pay, you pop it off to PayPal or Stripe, it's all standard, it's all nice and clean, um, and the payment is processed. Another great thing about this is, is that presumably um, the payment request API in, in Safari will have Apple Pay. A lot of people have Apple Pay. A lot of, less people have Android Pay, but some people still do. You can tell it to use Android Pay, and it will use, it'll use that, that built-in thing so you don't even have to worry about that, and it'll pass you back. You know, hey, they were charged this amount. It's going to go to your account. All that, all that's good, right? So it's nice and clean. It's nice and integrated. It gives your gives your uh, your user a lot more trust. It's actually pretty easy to use. You just new up a payment request, uh, passes you an object with all the functions you need. Uh, it takes some takes some options. Again, look at MDN. It depends on like your situation and like what type type of payments you take. Uh, the cost on this, uh, I set it up. Took me about three or four hours, and most of that was like one little tiny error that I had that I just couldn't figure out what was going on. Um, depends on your setup. Like if you're using Stripe, like this is super duper easy. Um, it's, it's all built in, like WooCommerce, we have it all built in, all ready to go for you. Um, and then lastly, 
uh, media session API. If you're playing videos or you're playing music or you're playing audio, if you have a podcast website, if you have anything that is playing any sort of media, it's a really, really bad experience when you have that, that notification and say, hey, the browser's playing something and you have this. Am I out of time? Okay, still got a minute or two. Um, so uh, you have that notification up there, but it doesn't really give you a whole lot of information on what's going on. It just gives you the ability to pause it. If you use the media session API, you can have fast forward, rewind, play next song. You can add an image. There's all sorts of great things you can do. So the moral of the story is PWAs, like it's this huge array of features. As long as you got HTTPS, you got your service workers going, you get that offline action, and you add your manifest and you add to home screen, they get you a majority of the way there, and then you just got to focus on making your site fast, which is really the toughest part of all of this. Um, so, uh, are there any questions, or are we out of time? I don't know. Still have 15 minutes. Still have 15 minutes? Yeah. Yes? Uh, do you get the sense how much um, this functionality is going to replace the, the, the desired for people to download apps to their phone, or um, I'm surprised that like one of the lighthouse things is to tell you to like you failed audit by not having a download app button. But I yeah, like, but downloading apps is annoying. I mean, well, I mean, like we said earlier, like we just don't download the number. We just don't download a whole lot of apps, and you really have to have a reason to download that app. Like, I have Nest in my house. Of course I'm going to download the Nest app and I'm so I can, like, see my thermostat and, like... But I don't know. I mean, like, if they had, like, a really, like, you know, quick-loading web, you know, web app, like, I might do it that way. I think it depends. I think there's always going to be a space for native apps. There's a lot of functionality that is still not available to the web. You know, there's all sorts of APIs that are not available and probably will never be available because of like you know the privacy implement implications of the web and like agreeing to all these things those APIs are just not going to be available so there's always going to be a space for um, for native apps and especially in like the game space that just the web just is not built for that kind of that kind of thing it can do a lot don't get me wrong I mean like web GPL has come a long way and like there, there, there is a lot of performance increases, but it just, it just doesn't, it pales in comparison today to, to native apps. I think that a lot of your, like, uh, I think that there's gonna be a, a lot of people that are gonna do both, right? Uh, and I think that for like smaller, smaller companies, this uh, PWAs make it a lot easier <coughs> to do a web experience that is really, really great and not spend as much money because you know when you have to build a bunch of different apps it gets really expensive even though we do have things like react native that allow you to build to multiple platforms it's still like you know it is train once build twice you know you're not you're not going to take your ios app from react native and instantly put it on the android app store uh, i think that this it's it's going to allow for more accessibility into that space, for certain. But I, again, I, I don't know. I remember hearing about PWAs four years ago, and I was like, "There's no way that's going to catch on." <laughs> uh, and and then, like in the last like six months, it is just I, I hear about it everywhere. And uh, so, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Data, whatever the service worker stores on the browser, when it will get cleared out. Like if I don't want anything, uh, the user has. As the user, you can go through and delete the service worker. You have to go through and delete the service worker. I don't know how that works with like when you clear your browser data, like you clear your history and you clear. I don't know if that clears out uh, service workers, but they are fairly long lived. Uh, so your service worker is going to be in there um, for, for a while. Even when the tab closes, or yeah, yeah, closes? It's, it's still running. Even when the browser is closed. Even when the br browser completely closed, like no dot next. Uh, sorry, yeah, no dot next to your app. 
I don't, I don't think it's running that. I don't think it's running that. But if your browser is open and you clo you've, you've installed my service worker, which I didn't ask you to do uh, as a user. You don't have to ask about that. Um, I've just installed it for you. My code is still running in your browser even though you closed that tab days ago, weeks ago. Um, and you can do all sorts of things like updating, updating assets. Like just because you haven't come back to my website, I can still in the background be updating assets. It has to be running also because like if, if it's going to receive push notifications from from the server to give you that to give you that notification, uh, it has to be running in the background. Yeah, uh, they, it doesn't. It definitely doesn't run when Chrome is closed. Uh, I know because I've opened up Chrome and then gotten multiple notifications. Yeah, there are certainly some like. Security, like, oh my gosh, this is happening. But the security model of the of the browser is like is good. I mean, it's 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 black boxed. It doesn't have access to that service worker. Doesn't have access to anything else. Um, and they the reason that Safari hasn't done it uh, up until now. I mean, it's been in Chrome for two years, right? Well, why hasn't Safari done it? Uh, largely because they don't have as many developers on their on their core Safari team, but also because they wanted to ensure that they had the security, they had the security lockdowns so that it wasn't going to cause issues for users. Uh, Apple's really good at that kind of stuff. So, yes. Well, you say progressive web apps is a broader term that encompasses things like web components, or are there some differences worth articulating? Okay, so well. Web components are definitely a way to get, to build a progressive web app. Um, but web components, you don't necessarily have to have web components. Uh, if you're building web components in a very fast way, then it's a progressive web app feature, right? <coughs> but uh, like you could use React. You could use, you can use any technology and have what is considered a progressive web app as long as it's fast, right? It's gotta be fast, it's gotta be I integrated, R reliable, and E engaging, right? So as long as it as long as it is those things, right, you're good to go. As long as it's available offline and it's going to work all the time and it's going to be like a really really good ex app like experience for a user, um, it doesn't matter what technology you use. Web components, Preact, React. So. I'm sorry, who's going to ask a question? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. What, what's the utility of using the frame? Is it just an arbitrary uh, rubric to say PWA and that's a series of technologies versus having technology stand on their own legs? Yeah, uh, I mean, because like it doesn't really matter how you get there, right? It doesn't really matter how you build the app, right? As long as it, is, it, it meets those metrics, it is a progressive web app. And the only technologies you really have to absolutely have or HTTPS, the service worker, and the manifest. Other than that, it depends on like your application and what technologies you'll be using. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I remember you were saying it has to be available when it's offline and it yeah. uses caching. Yeah. So the, the pages and things will only be available if the person goes to them first before ah. it goes offline? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so like, here's a really good example. Um, of uh, okay, so I'm going to um, I'm going to show you this. So this website, right, is loaded, and I'm going to go offline, turn Wi-Fi off, boom, it's off. So now I can click through men's. Oh, <laughs> it didn't load it. Um, so I'm going to reload the men's t-shirts page. So now the men's t-shirts page is loaded, right? I'm going to turn Wi-Fi off again. It says you are offline down there in the bottom. Maybe I can make this bigger. And then I click ladies up. Oh, man. <laughs> okay. Well, so there are uh, there are things that you can implement to make sure that they have everything they need in case they go offline, right? Uh, okay. So if I go to the 
I come to the store, I'm online, right? I could load a couple items per category and load up their images so that they had everything when, if they go offline. Or if they click on ladies outerwear, I might, I might preload in my service worker, I might preload ladies t-shirts. And you can do all of those things. You just gotta program it. You j yeah, you just gotta tell it what to do. And unfortunately, you, you gotta be careful. I was just talking to somebody else and they have a, a big application and they implemented the service worker and they realized they were, they were hitting the limit of the service worker, which is 50 megs. 50 megs, yeah. Um, and the, they had 50 megs that they were pushing over the wire to their user when they loaded the home page. Because <laughs> they were just like, hey, let's just give them everything. If they're going to go offline, we just, they need to have everything, right? Well, no, no. Um, you also need to be really careful. Like in the United States, a lot of us have really, really good data plans. And, but there's some people that don't. And they, they, they are literally getting uh, robbed by like their provider, you know, because they, they have a lower data plan. They have like, a, you know, a gigabyte of data per month. And if they go over that, they got to pay like absurd amounts of money. Um, that's in the U.S. Like Canada, my relatives in Canada, they're like, they just, they rob us what? And in India, it's even worse. It's just like amazingly bad how much you have to pay for cellular data. Um, so, okay, anything else? All right, well, thank you very much. And uh, talk to you later.